Rod, in trying to understand what we are as human beings, one of the things that psychologists do is to compare humans with different animal species and look for trends or step function differences. Let's take a different data point that you've been a pioneer in, in terms of artificial intelligence and building robots and thinking machines, as some people say. What can we learn, if anything, about human beings from the work in artificial intelligence? One thing we can do is try and take those same step functions that, that those scientists see and try to build those into, the, into our robots and see if they do work. Okay. And sometimes they work well, and some of the other experiments work dismally. So that's a way of finding out whether the theories are plausible, I think. But uh, another thing we've learned is by having the robots interact with people or letting people look at them and how people interpret mm. what they do. Mm. Um, and it says something about humans. <laughs> uh, so one of my particular uh, favorites is some robots that we built in the 90s in my lab. One was named Cog, a, a human arm with, with two arms, <laughs> and another one that was named Kismet, which was just a head with pink ears and yeah. facial expressions. And we put into those robots some basic visual modules of gaze, direction, and being attracted to motion, and a little bit of expression, so they would uh, see some motion and look, <laughs> and maybe they'd saccade their eyes and then turn their head uh -huh. and look. And the students who built these robots knew everything about them. They'd programmed them. But they started putting partitions up in the lab so the robots couldn't see them. <laughs> and it wasn't because they thought, oh, the ro I've lost my privacy. It was because when they were concentrating on their work on something else, and another student had fired up the robot and was having it operate, the robot would go and look at them, and they'd feel they had to give a social response, and they'd have to look up. They couldn't ignore it because it felt so human. And we are, it seems, programmed to respond to that. We respond to dogs looking at us. We respond to all sorts of mm. creatures looking mm. at us. Mm. And even robots, which are... They're grotesquely mechanical. They're just aluminum and wires yeah. and stuff everywhere. But it's that motion and that <laughs> interplay between head and yeah. eyes, and people can't stop themselves from getting having a social um, interaction or a social yeah. awakening from that. Yeah, the staring effect is very an, in an interesting one, where people have to look back at it, and you, you wonder if people how they know you're staring at them, and vice versa. Yeah. So what 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 can we learn though about the about the uh, differences between human beings and other, other uh, 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 biological creatures by understanding the progress that we can make in AI? Well, I, I, think, I think we can decouple some things. So it turns out that the basis of social interaction, at least I think our work showed this, the basis of social interaction doesn't need to have as specific a model of the world as you do to do a, 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 a fundamental manipulation task where you want to put two things together because the basic social interaction doesn't need to... The, we can build a robot that can do it and carry on a conversation with a person without it knowing any object except from face. Yeah, yeah. And nothing else in the world is necessary. If it's drawn to motion cues, color cues, um, sound cues, that's enough to act like a social being. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, my, my analogy was, you know, you put a, a bunch of drugs into someone, uh, you know, social drugs, and they still have social yeah. interactions. <laughs> They're maybe not meaningful, yeah. but th that basic mechanism is, is, be is below the mechanism of intent and below the mechanism of understanding. And I think often we've thought, oh, humans are doing these social interactions. They're maximizing the information flow. That's yeah. one of the theories. Yeah. They're doing all sorts of, 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 of optimized computations. <laughs> yeah, right. And we just put the simplest stuff together, and it worked. Yeah. So, so maybe some of the things that we think are deeply human and have these complex, deep, profound reasons really are not so. And they're, they're superficial, not superficial, but important in their own respect, but they're modules, and there are many of these, and you fit them together, and somehow we, we artificially think these are bound together in some way. Yes, and, and furthermore, I think, that, you know, we know they must have come from evolution, so they, they exist in simple forms in animals, yeah. so they're already there without the rational thought and the rational language mm -hmm. that we can bring to bear on them. So they're just sitting there under the surface operating, and we 
tend to think they're much more complex than they may be. Okay, I mean, so that, that's one way of thinking. Um, but are there any truly step function differences where it's not a gradient between humans and other sentient creatures, whether it's, whether uh, we're trying to discern that in the animal world, or whether language is that or such, but is there any data that you can get a sense, in, even in your, your very early stages, uh, from AI in which you can see that in principle there will be some significant step function differences that will be hard to bridge, which would give a sense of human uniqueness, or not? Well, I'm not sure it's necessarily human uniqueness. It might be animal you know, okay. uniqueness uh, uh, at some, some point. So um, I, I, I tend to think of, of, of really four of these that uh, are, are very hard for AI systems today. Mm -hmm. uh, one is object recognition, uh, being able to recognize objects as distinct from motion, as distinct from color, as distinct from, from uh, faces, which are very specialized sorts of objects. So general object recognition. The second is dexterous manipulation. And maybe this is the uniquely human one. Although, you know, we see orangutans, we see chimpanzees do some forms of this, so it's not a total step function, but dexterous manipulation with fingers, mm. we are just hopeless at that with robots today. <laughs> and um, by the time a, 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 a child is maybe uh, six years old, they can tie shoelaces, you know, which we just can't get our robots to do. <laughs> no robot can tie, tie a shoelace, shoelace today. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, someone's built a robot which can tie shoelaces, <laughs> but it can't move a chess piece. It can't yeah. move <laughs> Another thing that our, you know, we've, our language systems have gotten much better at doing speech recognition. Mm -hmm. So they're almost usable on the phone for mm -hmm. many sorts of uh, interactions mm -hmm. with, with mm -hmm. spoken language systems. But they're nowhere near as good as, as humans are, even a four-year-old human, in terms of being able to deal with background noise uh -huh. and pick out right. the language and dealing with accents. By the time a child is four years old, they are very good at dealing with people who's not speaking their native language and have very strong accents, they can still understand them. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to a four-year-old child, you don't really have to be so careful about the grammar. You may be careful about the vocabulary because you know the child doesn't have a large vocabulary, but you can talk about, uh, you can talk counterfactual statements and all sorts of things, mm -hmm. and the child gets that. Mm -hmm. That's again hard for our computers. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is the theory of mind, uh, knowing what another person is thinking by making inferences about what you've seen them see and have seen them not see. And, uh, you know, by the time a child is eight or nine years old, they start to get pretty good at that. And there's a whole bunch of experiments about the chimpanzees over how much theory of mind they have. Yes, right, right. And our robots uh, and AI systems haven't been too good with the theory of mind either. Uh, what would you do with a robot to try to improve that? Because that sounds like the hardest one. I think the theory of mind is is got to come later once we really can do object recognition because you can't observe a yeah, person yeah, right. interacting with the world without understanding the objects. Right, right, and uh, right. so, in, you know, I sort of bucket things. I bucket things on things worth working on now, mm. things which are really deep philosophical questions, and yes, they will have interesting answers, mm. but even if I spend the next 50 years working on it, I'm not going to make a big impact yeah, on it. Yeah. And I think that's off in the future. Yeah. I think the object recognition, the dexterous manipulation, and the speech with accents and noisy environments, mm. maybe maybe those we can make some, some impact and on. And you need those the modules years. first before you Be can develop theory of mind. Yes. Like, and, and in fact, they come, that's exactly what happens with a child developing. A child doesn't have that stuff until much later. <laughs> well, evolution uh, took a long time, but it, 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 now when you see it in, in human beings, it happens very quickly over just a few years. Yes.